Good evening, everybody. My name is Mike Butterworth. I'm the director of the Center for Sports Communication and Media, part of the College of Communication, the Moody College of Communication at the University of Texas at Austin. It's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Obviously, your sa salads are on the table, and, and don't hesitate to get started with that. Dinner will be served in just a little bit. I'm going to introduce our MC for the evening in a moment, and uh, this will be the last that you hear from me. But I do want to make sure that I just offer a few comments uh, as we get started this evening. Uh, just to let you know, the Center for Sports Communication Media is not a department so to speak. Instead, we work between the different departments in the Moody College of Communication where we focus on the instruction, the practice, and the study of sports journalism, broadcasting, production, public relations, human communication, and a whole lot more. Uh, we sponsor the sports media minor for our undergraduate students. We're part of the sports communication certificate program for graduate students. We publish an annual report called the Politics and Sports Media Report. And we also sponsor a number of events, like the McGar Symposium on Sports and Society and the Frank DeFord Lecture in Sports Journalism. But this event, the Dan Jenkins Medal for Excellence in Sports Writing and the award ceremony that goes with it, is particularly special for us, uh, as we take tremendous pride in our relationship with the Jenkins family and in our role in preserving the legacy of the one and only Dan Jenkins. So as we settle in for dinner, I want to offer a few thank yous to start the evening. Uh, let me acknowledge first everyone in the Jenkins family, and in particular June, for their continued trust and friendship. As uh, most of you know, Dan was a proud graduate of Texas Christian University, uh, but we're nevertheless grateful that the home for this award is right here in Austin. Thank you to the members of the Jenkins Medal juries whose labor of love gifts us with remarkable nominees and winners each year. I appreciate their careful attention and commitment to the craft of great writing. In particular, my thanks to Michael McCambridge and Sally Jenkins who co-chair the process. Now, it was Michael's vision that led to creating the Jenkins Medal in the first place and he remains its fiercest champion. And Sally has achieved something truly special, both continuing her father's legacy and crafting one of her own in her own distinctive voice. And I should note, as we point out in the program, because Sally was nominated this year, she recused herself from the voting process. The fact that no one has expressed to me any concern about this is a reflection of her sterling reputation and the enthusiasm for her winning entry on Chris Everett and Martina Navratilova. I'd like to acknowledge the center's uh, manager, Christopher Hart, uh, who has made uh, so many of the things happen behind the scenes that make this evening possible. And we also have tremendous support from the Moody College of Communication and a special shout out to Gerald Johnson back here, who is our executive director for innovation and partnerships. And Gerald is proudly representing our Moody College leadership team. I also want to shout out to McKinnon Morton and everyone here at Headliners, Stephanie and Flavio tonight in particular, and all of the folks preparing and serving everything tonight. They do things really, really well here, folks. If this is your first time here, you will enjoy, I promise. Uh, we're really thrilled to have made this the annual home of the Jenkins Dinner. Uh, we're also quite thankful for the support of donors Andy Priest and Cindy Farmer and Tex Moncrief, whose generosity supports each of the two medals. Uh, Andy and Cindy uh, were on their way to the event this evening, uh, leaving from Houston. And if you know Houston traffic, uh, you know that that is a, a risky proposition. Unfortunately, it doesn't sound like they're going to be able uh, to make it this evening, but I do want to thank them uh, uh, either way. Uh, thanks also to our sponsors uh, for tonight. Uh, at the silver level, the Headliners Foundation's Vern Lundquist Institute for Sports Media. And at the bronze level, Austin FC, Austin's first major league professional franchise. And uh, UT alumnus, Cappy Magar. Uh, additional table sponsors include the Moody College of Communications School of Journalism and Media. and our Center Advisory Council members, John Berger and Matt Nordgren. Uh, your support means so much to us. It makes it possible for us to do the things we do, and we are grateful uh, for your continued uh, support. 
We also have tonight the privilege of welcoming some very special guests, Walter Yost Jr. and Neil Leiferth, the two preeminent sports photographers of the past 60 years. Between them, uh, between them, they have documented the most important athletes and events in the modern era of sports. And especially for our students, perhaps our younger audience members, if you don't think you're familiar with their work, I assure you, you are. They've truly seen it all, and some of it, at least, they'll be able to share with us tonight. Uh, we look forward to those great stories about Dan Jenkins, Sports Illustrated, and their favorite moments and photos when they speak later with Michael McCambridge. Finally, uh, we are here to honor Dan Jenkins and celebrate the art and craft of sports writing. We'll do that very soon, but please let me offer my congratulations personally to Sally Jenkins and to Grant Wall. I know it pains Sally not to be here tonight. She's in New York for the US Open, but we will hear from her. And a big thanks to Joe Posnanski for being here to present her medal, even if virtually. Meanwhile, I think I can speak for everyone when I say I wish that Grant could be here with us. Uh, Celine and Eric, uh, I can't thank you enough uh, for your presence uh, and for your kindness. Uh, there are already have been and there will be more tributes to Grant's humanity and professional achievements. Uh, we're honored to play even a small role in being able to celebrate uh, who Grant has been and what he has meant to everybody here. With that, I know we're all eager to get started, so I'm going to turn things over for the evening to our MC, the esteemed writer and broadcaster, Seth Davis. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Welcome to uh, Austin, Texas. I would call Austin my home away from home, but I feel like my home in LA has become my home away from home. I am the proud father of now not one but two Longhorn undergraduates. So, um, yes, they will be on a, a plane to Michigan tomorrow. So uh, apparently the tuition and housing costs were not quite high enough for the Davis family. But uh, despite the fact that Alex Wolf uh, has a daughter at Michigan and he's a closet uh, Wolverine fan, I think we all uh, are anticipating a very positive result for the Longhorns on Saturday. And I will also be there as well because I'm a sucker for a good time. So anyway. Um, I've done you know, my share of emceeing in the past. This is a really easy night because I'm mostly just handing the ball off to some extremely uh, talented people, phenomenal writers and great people. And the most important thing that I'm gonna do tonight is tell everybody, please eat, please drink, enjoy, and uh, we will be back with what will be a terrific program uh, honoring some true giants in the profession. So happy eating, we'll see you in a little bit. Seth Davis back with you again, everybody. Thank you very much. Please continue to eat. We're going to go through our, our, our program as, as we finish uh, up the meal. Um, and we're going to start by um, bringing up, we're going to have a lot of great uh, writers and great media folks um, taken to the microphone. And uh, it just so happens now he's very, as you guys probably know, authors are extremely shy about mentioning their books particularly books that are going on sale in two weeks. So Joe, being Joe, would never mention that he has a book coming out in two weeks called Why We Love Football, uh, which is going to be uh, published by Dutton. So we were going to bring huge piles of books uh, for Joe to sign for everybody, which would be very cheesy, so that's not happening. But after dinner, there's a bus uh, down the street going to take everybody to the local Barnes & Noble, and you can go from there. Anyway, uh, Joe Posnanski is going to introduce our best sports writing winner. So Joe Paz to the mic. I was I was told there would be books. Am I, are, you, are you saying no? That that didn't happen. Um, <clears throat> it's a great honor for me to be here. I uh, love this event so much, and and you know it's so meaningful. I, I was trying to figure out how to introduce Sally's incredible story about Chris Evert and and Martina Navratilova, and I was thinking about and you know we have quite a few writers in this room, people who want to be writers, people who are who are you know 
value themselves as writers. And and I think what happens when you're a writer reading a great story, I think something clicks in your mind where you try to figure out how they did it. Like there's there's a part of you that that's go well. Why, what makes this work? Why is this so great? What like like what did they do? How did they use their reporting? How did they write the story to make it like magical? You know, and I think the very very best of these, and I think Sally's story is a perfect example of it, is you read it and you try to figure out how she did it, and you can't. No matter how long you've been doing this crazy thing, no matter how many stories you've written yourself, you just can't figure it out. And I, I, don't, I don't usually have notes uh, when I'm speaking, but I, I wrote down a couple of quotes from that story that I just kind of wanted to share, because I just want to, to give you a sense. The story is about, of course, Martina Navratilova and Chris Everett's uh, longtime friendship, rivalry, at the end, after their careers were over, they both sort of lifted themselves up through this very troubling time in their lives. And the story has to get us what, what is, you know, as a writer, you think about the journey that every story has to take. The story has to get us from this moment when they met, when they were both teenagers and they didn't necessarily like each other and, and take us through this incredible rivalry that they had throughout their lives and then take us to the post career when they're trying to figure out what they want still to do from life and then finally take us to this connection that they had and so I, I wrote down a couple of, of uh, lines from the thing and I'm just going to read them so this comes from right at the very beginning um, and it says it's as if they were perfectly constructed to test each other and to whip up intense reactions from their audiences. The adorable blonde American middle-class heroine with a frictionless grace against the flurrying East European with sculpted muscles who played like a sword fighter. And with that, you just, now you have it. Now you know what that rivalry was. And that rivalry begins and they, they go back and forth there was, a, there was a period of time when Chris Everett is the dominant of the two. And when she's dominating, they're good friends because Chris Everett can be friends with somebody she can always beat. And then Martina starts getting better and suddenly Chris Everett cuts her off because now she's a real rival and she can't care for a real rival. And so there's a period of time where Martina dominates. And now she's the one that doesn't want to be friends. She's the one that can be cold because she's the dominant. And then toward the end of their career, they, Chris Everett lifts her game and they have this sort of final moment. And this final moment is this great match that they play uh, that's three sets long and, and just an incredible uh, display of both of their, just their, their greatness as players, but also what they've learned about tennis and life and each other. And then it's over, and this is what she writes. The embrace at the net is one of their enduringly favorite pictures. They threw their arms over each other's shoulders, mutually exhausted, yet beaming over the quality of the tennis they had just played. You can't tell who won, Nevertolova said. And to me, this story, and for anybody who has not read it, do it immediately, um, those two quotes tell you about the journey. And, and I, you, it's a story that you read and at the end you feel a little bit changed. And that to me is the greatest of all kinds of stories. So congratulations to the great Sally Jenkins. Hi, thank you so much for this award. Nothing means more to me than to win something with my father's name on it. But more importantly, I think in this instance, nothing means more to me than to win for this particular story. Um, I felt so influenced uh, by these two people, Chris Everett and Martina Navratilova, and uh, to be able to write the full story of their uh, competitive relationship and their friendship uh, was something I very badly wanted to do right and do well. And the fact that it 
uh, turned out to be something that people read as much as they read it and um, that's being honored uh, with an award is really meaningful. Uh, I, it's the one story I wanted to do well more than any other. And so the fact that the judges thought it turned out that way uh, is incredibly gratifying. Um, I do wish I was there. I love Austin. I miss my colleagues. I miss Texas. And uh, again, I can't thank you enough. Yeah, I think one of the rules of, uh, of being an MC at an event like this is not to come up and try to speak after Joe Posnanski, who's a brilliant writer, is reading brilliant writing from Sally Jenkins. So I'm going to have to talk to my agent about the placement of tonight's program. Um, and I'm really looking forward to uh, this, this next segment um, with Michael McCambridge because, you know, Neil Leifer and Walter Yost um, have had their names on um, some of the most significant works of photojournalism of the last half century plus. And as Neil was pointed out, uh, their names have never been properly captioned large enough for people to see. And so too often uh, photographers do not get recognized in that manner. And even less frequently do we get to hear from them about the art and the craft and the diligence and the grind of being a photojournalist. So I'm so glad as someone who spent 22 years uh, at Sports Illustrated um, that these two giants um, of the visual arts of uh, journalism are here tonight. And we're going to get to hear from them. And they are going to be uh, speaking with a, a, a great questioner and journalist as well, Michael McCambridge. So I turn it over to Michael. I realize not everybody here is intimately familiar with the glory days of Sports Illustrated. So before we talk to Walter and Neil, I want to take just a few minutes um, trying to put into context what they did and why they are here tonight. What the Beatles and Rolling Stones were to rock and roll music in the 60s, that's roughly what Neil Leifer and Walter Yost were to sports photography. Except in this analogy, there is no Dylan. There's just the two artists. Um, Walter and Neil, they did not create the genre. There were pioneers like High Peskin and Robert Rieger who went before them. What they did though, through their work, was elevate the form and eventually through their artistry transcended it and made it something more than people thought it could be. And their influence across the 60s and 70s and beyond is pronounced. When we think of the collective memory of the great sports events of those decades, what we often have in our mind are images that were created by Walter and Neil. Both of them were prodigies, and they started at a very early age. This photograph was taken by Neil, 1958 NFL title game. This was the classic, Alan Amici plunging across the goal line in sudden death overtime to lift the Colts over the Giants. And what you need to know about this picture, besides the remarkable composition and the photographer being in exactly the right place at the right time, is that Neil did not have a press credential. He didn't even have a ticket. The way he got into the stadium was he had been volunteering all season long to push the wheelchair of disabled war veterans who were allowed into the end zone at Yankee Stadium. So while the other people who would wheelchair the handicapped people in would then jet off and go somewhere else in the stadium, Neil stayed there with his camera. And he got this picture, the best picture from the 1958 NFL title game that is still considered by many to be the greatest game ever played. Also, it was Neil's 16th birthday. Walter Yost was also a prodigy. This magnificent picture, 
taken before the days of autofocus and motor drives, occurred in the final minute of a 1961 Colts 49ers game. Walter got this one shot of Jimmy Orr catching a touchdown pass from Johnny Unitas. He was six months out of high school. His father, jazz musician, had given him a year to follow his dream and see what happened. And he followed it just as aggressively as Neil followed his. Both of them wound up getting cover photographs in Sports Illustrated as teenagers. This was Neil's first, November 20, 1961, followed up a week later. I don't know how many Texas exes remember Jimmy Sexton. Sexton, sorry. Um, and Walter did the same at 19, Art Mahaffey on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Um, very quickly, they developed a mutual respect, but also a fierce rivalry. And the other thing that you have to understand about Sports Illustrated and this era is that there were no staff photographers at this time. You got a little retainer for going out and covering a game, but then you only made money if they ran your picture. And you made the most money if you got on the cover. And the competition on the cover was intense in the big events, never more intense than in the Super Bowl. More photographers every year. And this is what happened in the first four Super Bowls. Yost gets Super Bowl one, a hungover Max McGee in the end zone. Lifer gets Super Bowl two. Vince Lombardi, his last game as a Packers coach. Yost gets Super Bowl three. Joe Cool on the sidelines. Lifer gets Super Bowl four. Lenny the Cool and the Chiefs victory. They went back and forth across the decade and beyond. And before I bring them up, I just want to quote you one statistic. Getting on the cover of Sports Illustrated once as a photographer was a big deal. And remember, SI was published weekly back in those days. Together, Yos and Leifer have had more than 500 cover photographs on Sports Illustrated, more than a decade of the magazine's existence. So please welcome, if you will, Walter Yos and Neil Leifer. Come on up, gentlemen. The other thing that I, I want to start with tonight is just what an ordeal it was back in the days of late color, when color photography was not common and was not generally handled quickly. And across that decade, Yosin Leifer got photographs like this. Don Drysdale after the World Series in 1963. Bob Gibson, that's a Yos picture. First one was Leifer. Bob Gibson pitching in the World Series. That was oh, not the World Series. I stand corrected. That was a twinite doubleheader in St. <laughs> Louis. Lifer with the great angle behind the backboard of Lou Alcindor at UCLA. And then Yos. Bill Russell and that perspective on Wilt Chamberlain. And finally, another great Celtics Lakers picture and then one of my favorites, which at dinner last night, Walter praised Neil by saying that this picture, Muhammad Ali ascendant after the knockout of, was it Cleveland Williams? Yes. Was the perfect picture. It's not just the pictures, it's what they had to go through to get them and get them back. Let me start off by asking each of you, what was your roughest close? your roughest weekend of shooting a big event and getting it back to the lab in Chicago in time to get in the magazine that week. I'll start with you, Walter. Well, thank you. I'm going to go that Green Bay game 
the coldest game in the history of football. And we went, I mean, we, we took a plane from Green Bay to Chicago, and, and you didn't even have gloves on. I mean, we got into the airport, and no one was eating. And I remember going to get a Milky Way out of a machine. And I got on the plane, and we kept telling the guy, that the pilot, turn the heat on. He was in a T-shirt. We were frozen. I built the Milky Way. It was like biting into this microphone. <laughs> and then we got to O'Hare. I'd like to go back to this picture because, unfortunately, you don't see the square format on this. This is a picture where Neil put a remote up. And today, even if you did this picture, it would never work because it'd be logos all in the ring. I mean, this is a picture I have, I own from Neil. And you could hang it any way. Just twist it four directions, and it's still perfect. Neil hung it as a diamond in his apartment. And it was still perfect. I mean, it's, you couldn't take a better picture than this. Well, I've got to tell you, say, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm going second, because I was going to choose the same game. Walter and I, and I think Jim Drake, were on a flight to Miggs Field in Chicago, which was very close to Donnelly's printing plant, where they closed the magazine. Two things about the night. We were in a twin engine, I think Cessna. <laughs> It was, it was not weather to be flying in. It was snowing lightly. The, the runway was iced. But much worse than that, the same company that we flew on a week before had had an accident at Miggs Field with a very famous rock and roll band. I forgot the country western singers that were killed in that flight. Mm -hmm. And I just remember not wanting to get on that plane, but we had to get the film back. <laughs> and it was, it was the scariest flight I've ever been on. Yeah, so that we was the worst Miggs thing. was one of the worst airports of all time. You'd fly in there. And we've, we risked our lives so many times getting film on planes. I remember Tony Triello and I flying around. We couldn't land. And we were running out of fuel. We were going to Texas somewhere. And we just had to land or we were going to die. <laughs> Take a choice. Things, things eventually got a little better because we started flying back with, from Europe on uh, the Concorde with film. That was a great excuse to get the film back on time. <laughs> Not a bad way to travel. And, uh, and when, when he didn't, I, I, covered, I covered a great UT game when UT won the national title and beat Arkansas in Fayetteville. In 69. In 69. Well, that was easy. We went from the stadium. They had a car waiting for us to a Learjet, which flew us to Chicago. And the irony was, it was actually, it saved money for the magazine, a lot of money. Because the printing presses in Chicago, there was a time, it might have been three in the morning or four in the morning, when they pressed the button to start printing three million copies of the magazine. If they're late, it's 25000 This was in the 60s. It was $25,000 an hour to be late on press. It was $5,000 to rent a Learjet. Mm -hmm. So we were flying very first class. It wasn't a rough, rough week ever. It wasn't like Green Bay every week. <laughs> oh, the first Super Bowl, we flew, I got to get the film back from LA. We flew on a Learjet and we stopped to refuel at uh, Grand Island, Nebraska, which is the midpoint in the United States to refuel. And I remember, I think I, I, I lit up some stuff on one of those planes. <laughs> And the pilots would go crazy. I don't think it was that flight, though. <laughs> there were a couple other flights. In my career, I've covered two, two people, Walter being one of them. The other was Willie Nelson. I've never lit up any stuff. But, <laughs> but believe me, all you had to do was go on Willie Nelson's trail. I spent a week with Willie Nelson. You might still be high from day. that. <laughs> so, you, you might need rehab. OK, moving on. I right. want to show from rehab. I want to show now some, some Walter pictures and some of Walter's favorite covers. This picture I heard people talking about, and this is, uh, you know, I don't know what the three most viewed Joe Namath pictures are, but I know this is definitely one of them. And you begin to get to see the artistry of Walter. This was a picture of the weathered hands of the Pittsburgh Steelers, L.C. Greenwood, that was part of the work that Walter did with Roy Blunt Jr., the year that Roy Blunt Jr. wrote the best book ever written about pro football, about three bricks shy of a load. And this is Muhammad Ali in Vegas, wasn't it? Yes. Against Someone's flash went off. Right. 
it could have been yours or Herbie's. So this light, you know, I was, I had a, excuse me, this was someone else's strobe that went off. I had a bad position. So Neil and most of the guys were ringside. I was up in the stands and maybe I was shooting in like 125th of a second. And while this picture took place, someone's strobe just synced up to part of my frame. And you get this amazing picture, you know. Right place at the right time. Yeah. This, my was, dolphins. this was on the cover of Walter's book with Dan Jenkins' football. Great coffee table book still. Here's some of Walter's favorite covers. And we're going to go through these quickly. And I've got a question for him on the last one. Texas X, Ricky Williams. And finally, there's this one. And I think the, what, what speaks to the power of this picture of the catch, so many of our memories in the modern age of sports, when everything is televised, has to do with the video we see. But when people remember Dwight Clark's The Catch, they don't remember the CBS broadcast and that angle. They remember this. This was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Now, Walter developed a reputation, photographer as jazz artist. He was intuitive. And one of the things he was intuitive about was wide receivers. Jimmy Orr, that first picture, Lynn Swan, John Stallworth, and here he was with Dwight Clark. Now, my question to you, sir, is how did you know to be standing in that corner of the end zone for that play? Well, obviously, there's some luck involved in this. But since I was so attuned to pass receivers, I always felt where I went was the place that was the right, the right place. I didn't want to be near the goal post because the goal, goal, goal post could block you off. Mm -hmm. Montana was a righty quarterback. He's going to go roll right. He's not going to roll left. Mm -hmm. So you're thinking about this before the play. But to set this up, I had spent the season with the Dallas Cowboys from July in Thousand Oaks, California, to this game in the wet candlestick park where they broke my heart <laughs> by losing. And I remember going to the locker room. I've been with this team since July. It's the worst locker room I've ever been in my life. It was like every player's mother had just died in a car crash. And I was devastated. I didn't know I had this picture. I mean, the film went into New York, and then on Wednesday, this came out, and it's probably my most well-known picture. Magic. Now let's look at some lifer pictures. And I thought this one would be appropriate. <laughs> Texas Navy, 1963. Daryl Royal leading the troops out. And this picture, which if you want to know how the Super Bowl was in year one, that's it. Just the four team captains. There's your pageantry for you. And this picture. And look at the eyes of Dick Butkus. We're also going to get, um, after this, this is uh, the cover of Neil's great Tashin book of football photographs, Johnny Unitas in the Mist. And now we're gonna get some of Neil's favorite covers and then I've got a question for him. Tokyo, 1964 Olympics, the torchbearer, Namath in motion. And this was, this was not in Neil's favorite, but it's always been one of my favorites. Nicholas and his caddy with a heater in his mouth after the big putt. <laughs> the thrill in Manila was, in many people's minds, the greatest fight of all time. And for those who did not get to see it live, the best depiction was in the pages of Sports Illustrated. And this was Neil's cover photo. Neil, my question to you is, when this fight was going on, I've heard so many ringside witnesses talk about the ferocity of the fight. 
when you were shooting it, did you recognize how much punishment these two men were dishing out and enduring? S certainly not at the beginning of the fight. Uh, this fight was that rare fight that probably shouldn't have happened. I mean, Muhammad was looking pretty good, even though he'd been fighting so many years. He had, he had, he'd been laid off for three years when he couldn't fight because of his situation with the draft, uh, not not stepping forward to be inducted in the army. But he was back in great form. Muhammad looked fantastic. And everyone thought it, the fight in Manila was going to be a very easy fight for him. Uh, Joe Fraser, on the other hand, had looked pretty, pretty weak in his previous couple of fights. Uh, his career was really over. He took this fight for money. He was going to make a lot of money, and it would end the trilogy. And I remember just, I'm no, normally a very nervous ringside, and certainly when the opening bell happens. This was a boondoggle. This was a great trip. I mean, uh, I spent a couple of days in Tokyo before we got to Manila. Uh, it was a wonderful experience the whole time, but the fight was going to be an easy fight to cover and probably one that would be forgotten soon after. Well, when the bell rang for round one and you, the first couple of rounds, you're feeling things out just like the fighters are feeling each other out. In the first two or three rounds, Muhammad looked like this was going to be the easy night everyone expected. I remember so you sort of you have 12 frames in the camera, and you want to be, be sure you're not on frame 10 when the knockout happens. Even though I had a second camera, and I had an assistant loading a second camera, but in the time you could change cameras, that's when the fight could end. And I thought that was going to happen. Muhammad was just, he looked terrific for three or four rounds. And somewhere around the fourth or fifth round, I don't remember the film well enough, Fraser started hitting him with body punches. And they were, they were all landing. And they were really good punches. And it got into six, seven, eight. By about the ninth, and they used to fight 15 rounds in those days. Mm -hmm. Today they fight 12. Uh, I would say it's the ninth or 10th round when I began to think to myself, hey, this is a pretty good fight. <laughs> And at the end, it was the most ferocious, uh, ferocious thing I, I ever saw. It is certainly the greatest fight, uh, boxing match I ever covered. And I think most everyone that was there would agree with that. Uh, it was a big surprise to me. And that cover is still one of the most memorable covers ever. No UPC code to interrupt the, the construction of the picture and just the simple headline, no subhead needed. I had, um, done, I had done a cover on Don King, the promoter of the fight, yeah. with Fraser and Ali in the studio, which Don liked. He was invited by Ferdinand Marcos, who was president. Of the, to, to, they, they had a, a party for Ali and Fraser. Fraser was so beaten up, he didn't come. He stayed at the hotel. Ali came, and Don put me... I was the only person there with a camera, except for Howard Bingham, who was Ali's right. person. There were no cameras in the room, and... Ali posed with the Marcoses. I'm going to digress real, real quick. Digress. I, I asked if I, I asked Mrs. Marcos, we'd love it was a magnificent palace. It was right out of Tara. Mm -hmm. And she gave Peter Bonventry, the writer for, for Newsweek magazine, the three of us got a, a quick, and Ken Regan. Mm -hmm. No, not Ken, Ken was there. It was me and Peter Bonventry, and there was one other person with us. We got a quick tour of the of the palace. palace. Now, this is long before the stories broke that I'm about to get to. I, I had one camera. One day I didn't when I didn't come with four cameras that was going to be at the palace. And Dawn sat me at the table with Ali and the, and the president of the Philippines. She showed us the bedroom, and I saw the closet with the shoes. Well. What the hell would you want to take a picture of a closet? I thought all women had that many shoes. <laughs> I mean, I, I remember I never took a picture, but I photographed the a canopied bed. I photographed the kitchen. I photo we were there for 10 minutes the whole. She gave us a quick run through, and I never took a picture of the shoes. And years later, when the story broke, I got calls from people. You were in the palace. Did you ever see the shoes? Could have made a lot of money if I photographed that closet. The one that got away. OK. Next, I've asked each of these men last week to be thinking for all their years competing and collaborating, th their favorite story about the other. So, Neil, I want you to go first. Tell us your ice bowl story working against Walter Yost. I'm not sure favorite's the right word I use. <laughs> it wasn't exact. Well, first off, 
Walter, Walter managed to get every game in Miami, in Southern California. I was in, there were no dome stadiums yet, and I was in, uh, I was in Green Bay one week, I was in Detroit the next week, I was in Minneapolis the following week, and I worked pretty well. I, I couldn't wear gloves, the lenses were metal, and I found it harder to wear gloves than not wear gloves, but I, I, I was pretty good at working in the cold. Walter hated the cold. When we got to Green Bay for the ice bowl, and I have, I don't think there's ever been a better football photographer than Walter. Let me start off there and say I had so much respect for him that I've got to be on my best. I have to have my best game when Walter's the other photographer. And that seemed to be week after week as this championship game started. But I could see Walter was having a lousy day. I, we watched each other. I certainly watched Walter. I, I assume he watched me. But I was, where was Walter when that big play happened? And I, I just had... Just like athletes, sometimes you have a good day, sometimes you don't have a good day. I had a very good day for 59 minutes and 50 seconds, I think. And, and then they called, and I was, I was saying to myself, I've got Walter. This one's going to be easy. We're not only competing for the cover. And by the way, the cover was considered the gold medal. We're not only competing for the cover of the magazine, but we're competing for the opening spread. And like Walter said about his, his picture of the catch, I covered the Packers quite a bit. I was very familiar with the way they ran. The, gr the ground was ice. It didn't seem like the, you'd ever do a try a quarterback sneak there because uh, Vince Lombardi called timeout with 10 seconds or 12 seconds. One play left in the game, and they were on the one-foot line, and they were behind. Dallas was winning the game. And I assumed they would do the famous the Green Bay sweep. Right. Kramer and Thurston would pull out, and I went over to the right, so they'd be coming right at me, and Walter was right in the middle, looking right straight down at the center in the court, and of course, the Bart Starr snuck in from the end zone, and there's the opening was, spread. End of my good day. <laughs> Let me just preface this. Uh, I remember what, the wake-up call in Green Bay for that game. 10 a.m. and 10 below. I said, okay, that's not gonna be so bad. Maybe it'll warm up to zero. So by the end of the game, it was 28 below zero. And you couldn't load film. You know how difficult it was. And I had like three frames left in my camera. And there was no way you could roll, reload a roll of film because the leaders would break. It was impossible. So you had two or three shots. And it's slightly out of focus, but uh, it worked out. <laughs> Okay, Walter, your turn. Well, your favorite story about competing with Neil. Well, uh, Neil doesn't believe this story. <laughs> we were at a football game, a, a championship game. I think it was the Cleveland, Cleveland game. Cleveland, yes. And, you know, everyone wanted to cover it. It was Neil, Jim Drake, who's deceased now, a great friend of ours, and myself. And we're all in the end zone, but you know, we, we had to separate ourselves. I mean, you can't all be in the same spot, even though you all want to be in the same spot. And this play took place, and I know you don't say it happened, and Neil, always a cover expert, leaving room for the logo, went, cover, cover, I even ref left room for the logo. <laughs> he denies it, but I know it happened. <laughs> There, and indeed, there, this there was is the cover. no cover, possibility cover. that that would never have happened for the following reason. I had so much respect for Walter that even if I thought that was the case, I had no idea what he got. You couldn't have an. And I'll tell you something. It, it, it never. It never happened. Maybe Dan Jenkins wrote that line, or maybe Walter had had a couple of too many funny cigarettes that day, <laughs> and he heard. I never he mix heard. pleasure and and weed or work I, and weed. I will say, I will say this. Neil always did have a knack for leaving room for the logo, as you see here. Wow. Now, um, I want to talk a little bit about the way sports used to be photographed. I want to show four pictures here. This is Yost first, Dave Parker in the dugout, and, and then John Unitas's last game in Baltimore, and just the access to be able to do that. And then a couple Neil pictures on the same theme. The Giants great 
Roosevelt Brown on the sidelines. And Bart Starr, like you're, like you're the middle linebacker. So much of those pictures look so pure today. And when we see the field of sports today, there is so much signage. There is not yet a uh, QR code on the back of the Oklahoma State football helmets, but there's signage everywhere else. And I wanted to ask both of you, you know, Dan Jenkins, before he passed, when he would, would come here and come to these dinners, he would always talk about how much more difficult the job is today because of the challenge of getting access, the challenge of trying to deal with all the TV people, the challenge of trying to get to interview people. Do you think the job of sports photography is more difficult today? And if so, why? You want? Let's go back to the first two pictures. Okay. Let's go back to Dave Parker in the dugout and my man Johnny Unitas leaving the field. So I spent a lot of time with the Pittsburgh Steelers. And obviously, to get this access, this was in a spring training game in Bradenton, Florida. And I was literally this close. And baseball players always would smoke. And they would always like hide the cigarette like this and keep it down here. But they're always smoking. And this picture was in a couple of books of mine, in a baseball book that was Roger Angel wrote the, the text for. The New York Times reviewed the book and chose this picture out of all the pictures I had taken. And when Dave Parker saw this, I heard from someone else, he's going to kill me. <laughs> and Dave Parker was like 6'6", and you didn't want to mess with Dave Parker. The Cobra. The Cobra. And the guy in the background is Grant Jackson, who was a relief pitcher. So I ran into him, and he, he tore me up in front of everyone at the batting cage. It was one of those horrible moments of my life, but then we became friends again. Wow. And Johnny, my favorite quarterback of all time. Yeah, this was it. High tops. No one played like Johnny You Did he come back out? Did you ask him to no, run no, across? No, 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 no. I, I never met Johnny Unitas. I never spoke to Johnny until after his career and I got an assignment from Sports Illustrated, and this picture editor called me up. His name was George Washington. He said, he said I'm going to send you to photograph your, your hero. I said, really, Johnny? He says, yeah. I told him he worships you. I said, why would you tell him that? <laughs> so I went to Baltimore, and he had a vestibule in his house. And in the vestibule, because I mean, you have to think Baltimore was nothing. Yeah. D.C., New York City, and Baltimore just sat in the middle of nowhere. Talk to Frank DeFord about it. <laughs> and and the, the, the city of Baltimore gave him a, a bust of himself. You know, like, we worship you. <laughs> and then I went into his waiting room, and there were a couple of covers of mine up on the wall. And his arm was so bad, the golden arm, yep. he couldn't lift his cup of coffee. And I remember it was like my whole life had flashed in front of my eyes mm -hmm. that day. And after I photographed him, I could talk to him finally. I went in the car, and I broke down in tears. Yeah, it was like, it's like your whole life had flashed mm -hmm. in front of you. The power of sports. Yeah. Neil, what about you? More difficult these days well, to get pictures like this? Well, the access, as yeah. Dan Jenkins said, is, is so important. I mean, on the action pictures, you're exactly right about the game action, about the billboards and the, and the commercialism that's all over. But the really difficult part of covering sport today is access for the posed pictures, to get access to be with the athlete and have them either in the studio posing for you or at home. And I'll tell you how it's changed. When I started out in the 60s, even if we were kids, if you wanted to get Mickey Mantle, who was not known to be the friendliest with the press, <laughs> you waited for batting practice to be over. And you walked over to Mickey and said, you just put, stick your hand out. And you said, I'm Neil Life for Sports Illustrated. Uh, can I get a couple of minutes with you at some point? I want to 
to a posed picture. And depending on Mickey's mood, he would say yes or no. If you wanted to photograph Muhammad Ali, all you had to do was go to the Fifth Street gym. You could be from a local high school newspaper. And you waited for him to say yes or no. And he always said yes. I did a picture for the cover of Time magazine of Steve Cawthon when he the was jacket. about to win the Triple Crown. And I posed him. I had to talk him into it only because he thought it, it might be bad. To, it was going to be suggestive that kids are smoking. But I had him smoking a big cigar because we were going to run it after he won the race. And I told him that cigars, are, when, when, when a man gets a, a, his first child, a boy, you give cigars to all your friends. Uh, cigars are red our back a little cigar was synonymous with victory. And Cawthon posed with the cigar, and it's one of my favorite covers ever. It ran on the cover of Time magazine. And it, it, Cawthon loved it after it ran. Mm -hmm. So it's now a few years later, and it's worse today. And I get assigned by, by Newsweek to do a cover on Shaquille O'Neal. Well, what a great guy. I mean, I found he was fabulous. And I, I was shooting at his, at his mansion in Orlando. And he took a lot of time with me. He was sitting in his, in his living room, in his kitchen, having a cup of coffee. And he wants to know what I want to, what I want to do. Now, he's, he's, I thought he was his own man. And I told him about, he, the cover was going to be here just, I forgot the number. I believe it was $6 million. And the cover slug was going to be the $6 million man. And Newsweek was going to put him in the cover of the magazine. Pretty important magazine. Weekly mm -hmm. magazine, news magazine. Uh, not Time, but Newsweek. Anyway, uh, he, uh, he loved the idea with the cigar. I said, I want to get you. I, I brought some Cohibas with me. And I was going to stick him a cigar in his mouth and have the same sort of, because the cover of Cawthon had been so successful. Mm -hmm. He looks at me, and he's a very sharp guy. And he said, well, I like that idea. It's make a great cover. I brought the cover of Cawthon to show him. He said, let me call my agent. <laughs> I knew I was in trouble. And to make a much longer story short, five minutes later, we were on a conference call with his agent in Chicago, his manager in Los Angeles, his lawyer, wherever the hell he was. And they all determined that they couldn't have their star athlete smoking a cigar. And it was the silliest thing ever. But that's what your access is that's what very you're dealing different. with. Now, I um, would have talked Shaquille into it, if it was just me and him. <laughs> if it was just you and him, I'm sure. Now, even back in the days when athletes were more cooperative, not everybody was a good subject. We did some research and we tracked down this photograph. This was taken in 1977 in Columbus, Ohio, after Uwe von Schaman of Oklahoma had just kicked the field goal to put the Sooners up 29 to 28 on Ohio State. And the man in the tie chasing the photographers off is, of course, Woody Hayes. In the center is the Columbus dispatch photographer. And the unidentified cameraman, of course, is Walter Yost looking like he's about to run a really good 40-yard dash. <laughs> what can you tell us about this moment in time, Walter? Well, <laughs> it started about a year before that. Uh, who was it? Archie Griffin? Who was yes. a, great, a great running back at Ohio State. And I photographed him the year before. And I had to meet him at, in Woody Hayes' office. Woody Hayes did not like me at all. I mean, long-haired guy. From the moment I walked in, he hated me. <laughs> and so at this game, so it was like a minute left in the game, and I go, he's having a huddle on the field, and I go in there with the camera, and he sees me. And this is as close as I've gotten to the Heisman Trophy Award. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to kick me you know where. And this ran on the front page of the Columbus Dispatch. Dispatch. Yes. Yeah. The next day. <laughs> it's like... One of my favorite pictures of myself, actually. <laughs> and he missed. <laughs> Neil, who was your least favorite subject? Wow. Woody Hayes was not a favorite of mine, but he wouldn't be my least favorite. I, I probably Leo DeRocha or Larry Holmes. Leo DeRocha was just, I was assigned to do pictures of Leo when he, he was, he was probably going to get his, uh, his a managerial job. He was a coach on the Dodgers. And every time I'd pick the camera up, he'd go like this. I, I introduced myself to him. He had, didn't shake my hand. 
he just had no interest. He didn't say anything. He didn't mm. do anything. But he wouldn't let me take a picture of him. He and Jim Rice, Jim Rice of the uh, Red Sox, Red Sox uh, is the only time really? we were going to do a time cover. There is a God because he was he was he looked like he was going to be the first person to bat 400. It was late. I believe it was early, might have been late August or early September. He was hitting 407, 407 or whatever. And time assigned me to shoot a cover of him. When I went up and talked to him about, and he just had no interest in me. And he, he did the same thing that Leo did. And I called the editor at time. I said, I don't want to photograph this guy. Can I come home? And they assigned someone else. Could have been Walter. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't remember who they assigned, but they assigned Hiroshima, somebody else. I and uh, and I, I went home, and he immediately went into a slump. I think he batted 380. It wasn't exactly a bad slump, but he never got Karma. to cover a time. <laughs> well, the closest to 400 was George Brett, though. George Brett in 1980, mm -hmm. 390. That was it. Um, I want to just take, as we're wrapping up here, a moment to talk about the sporting icons that each of you is most identified with. And Walter and Michael Jordan had a special relationship. And among Walter's many memorable pictures of Jordan is this one. And this doesn't get done without a very wealthy, very busy, very in-demand athlete being very cooperative with a photographer he respects. Tell us about this shot. Well, okay, this is called the Blue Dunk. To get, this was the second day we ever worked together. This was 1987, and I did a cover portrait of him the day before. And this idea came from a, a, a German sports drink company called Isostar. And you would take an example would be a red clay court. You take a tennis player and a cherry picker. You photograph him with a shadow where you see the the shadow of a serve, so you know exactly what the sport is. Then they'd retouch him out, and you'd send him there drinking. I said, you know, this is a great idea, but I need a vehicle. So I went to Chicago. Uh, I painted one court red. I didn't, my assistants, in the parking lot. <laughs> the other court blue, because I didn't know what uniform he was going to show up in. Got a cherry picker. You think you get an NBA basket in Chicago? <laughs> we had to bring one in from St. Louis <laughs> because you, you can't do this shot with a stationary basket because everything's got to be moved. This could only be done one hour a day <laughs> where the shadow's not too far, too close. So he showed up in the red, went to the blue court, had a camera, took 14 frames a second, and the blue dunk was born. There you go. Okay, Neil. This picture. This picture has been described as the most iconic photograph in the history of sports. And I just want to point out the gentleman you see with the forlorn expression on his face between Ali's legs is Herb Sharfman of Sports Illustrated. He pulled rank on Neil and got the preferred photographic position. And that expression is of him realizing he is on the wrong side of history. <laughs> And here is Muhammad and Neil with the picture. When did you find out Ali? Herbie. <laughs> when did you find out Ali loved the picture? And did he ever talk to you about this specific picture? Well, Muhammad talked any photographer he spoke to. He put his arm around the. I watched him once put his arm around Howard Bingham, and I said, "So what did he?" They were talking for a while. I said, "What did he say?" He said, "The picture I shot last week's the greatest picture he's ever seen of him." So Muhammad did tell me more than once, but Ali would have said that to anybody. He was just such a complimentary kind of guy. If he saw Walter, he would have said to Walter, Annie Leibovitz, anybody who photographed Muhammad, Muhammad Ali and gave him a print, he would say, this is the best picture ever taken of me. Love this picture. Uh, In this case, he was right. <laughs> well, you, you know, I gave him this picture. I also gave him my favorite picture, which is for one you showed of Cleveland Williams. Mm -hmm. And I I think he actually liked that better than this, but he, but he hated he hated Liston, so that, that was special. That, that adds to this photograph from the way Ali looked at it. Uh, but the picture the picture wasn't, remember, it never made the cover of Sports Illustrated until the end of the century. It was the fourth page in a four-page spread. There was another photographer's picture on the cover of that fight. It won no awards. I mean, not even honorable mention in the National 
Press Photographer's Annual Contest for Pictures of the Year. The picture grew as Ali's reputation grew. And I mean, and uh, believe me, I'm, I've never met a modest photographer. If you mean it, not a good one anyway. So I'm not trying to be modest about it. I'm very proud of the picture. But this was luck. And as you pointed out, having Herbie between Ali's legs, Herbie took this, maybe my favorite, he took the famous Marciano, it's called the Rubber Face, mm -hmm. Marciano Walcott picture. I mean, he's a fabulous boxing photographer. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was looking up at Ali's rear end. Not a very, not a very good picture. <laughs> um, I just want to say, as we close, um, a lot of us ink-stained wretches here miss the glory days of Sports Illustrated. We miss the bonus pieces. We miss Jenkins on the big college football game, Curry Kirkpatrick on college basketball. But we also miss these images, and it's great to be able to talk with you tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Walter Yost and Neil Leifer, the two greatest sports photographers who ever lived. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. So I don't know what you guys are doing when this dinner's over, but I'm hanging out with Walter for the rest of the night. So wherever, wherever he's going. We're going to Willie's house right down the street. Get a little, little contact. High. That was great. I love, I love the stories behind, love the stories behind the stories. That was great. Um, we are now going to recognize our uh, lifetime achievement winner, uh, Grant Wall. Um, you know, I, I got to Sports Illustrated in 1995. Uh, Grant got there a year later, um, and we both covered college basketball for a while. And I know that Celine and Eric have heard me say this many times, but really one of the great things that happened to my career as a college basketball writer was when Grant Wall decided to write about soccer. Because as long as the two of us were at Sports Illustrated, it was clear who was better. And I had no problem admitting it um, because he was. He was better. And, um, you know, Grant, Grant was a lot of fun. You know, there's a, what we're going to hear a lot tonight about what is a writer and a reporter, but I can tell you being on the beat, um, with Grant, he was a lot of fun. I don't know if I've, um, you guys have heard, heard me tell the story before, but there, there was a time at SI when Tubby Smith was the coach of Kentucky and, and whoever, it was probably Alex who probably pissed him off, but he was not talking to SI. And so I went in there, tried to do something on Kentucky and I wanted to interview Tubby Smith. I asked the then SID Brooks Downing. I said, if I brought like a tree branch and gave it to Tubby and said, this is an olive branch from SI. Would you, you know, do you think he would receive that well? And Brooks and Owen Tubby said, he, I think that'd be great. So I showed up at practice with a branch and I gave it to him and Tubby laughed and I had the interview and everything went great. So when I told Grant that story, he wanted to do the same thing going to Cincinnati to talk to Bob Huggins, who was pissed off at Don Yeager. And so, as Grant tells a story, he did the same thing. He got the tree branch. He's sitting in Hugs' office, and Hugs goes into his office, and he can hear Hugs on the phone, talk to his assistant, tell that guy with his effing stick to get out of my office. <laughs> uh, Grant was a lot of fun on the beat. I remember, you know, when Grant would write in, in the press room, like at the Final Four, he had uh, noise cancellation earphones, and he would... Uh, eat uh, Altoids, suck on Altoids, and drink Mountain Dew so he could get all hyped up on caffeine. And I remember standing with Dan Wetzel, who's another great writer now at, at uh, Yahoo, and saying, what's he listening to? And I'm like, uh, he's got noise cancellation headphones, which Grant said not only would make it quiet, but would tell everybody else, leave him alone, he's writing on deadline. And it's like, what is he putting into his mouth? I'm like, so Altoids and Mountain Dew. And Dan looked at me and he goes, he's pretty intense. <laughs> and he was. He was just... Um, he was a lot of fun. He was a lot of fun. And so uh, I can't think of anyone better uh, to uh, introduce Grant and talk about Grant than his fellow Princetonian, Alex Wolf. And I, I just want to say this, because we were talking about Alex at, at the table. You know, I grew up, all I ever wanted to do was write for Sports Illustrated. It's truly all I ever wanted to do. The fact that I did it for 22 years still blows me away. And so I became a student at Duke 
and obviously a college basketball fan. And Alex Wolf was the primary writer at Sports Illustrated for college basketball. So for me, wanting to do this and wanting to be an SI, there was no bigger name for me than Alex Wolf. And I met Alex when he came to Duke uh, to do a story on uh, Coach K. And then, like, a few years later, I'm actually at Sports Illustrated working with Alex Wolf. Like, if the story had ended there, it would have been amazing. But the thing about Alex, and this is why Alex and Grant got along so well, we think of reporters and journalists and all we're celebrating tonight. It's kind of a cutthroat business, and you got to slash and burn and it's competitive and you got to be aggressive in information and you're investigating people and maybe you're getting them fired and there's a toughness about it. Alex Wolf might be the single nicest person I've ever met. And I was able to watch him at a very formative time in my journalism career, just be able to do his job with such kindness and the kindness that he treated everybody else with, um, helped him do his job because they wanted to help him out. They wanted to give him information. And that has really set the tone for me in so many of my relationships. And the last thing I'll say about Alex is I do blame you for delaying my development as a writer because I got to Sports Illustrated and I was working with you and for you and helping you put together your pieces. And I was trying to write like you. And I wasn't very good at it. And I had to come to this realization that I am not as good as Alex Wolf, and I'll never be as good as Alex Wolf. And then I looked around the press room and the whole industry, and I said, well, no one else here is as good as Alex Wolf either, so I can live with that. So to bring up at this place and this time Alex to talk about my friend Grant with Celine and Eric here is just a special moment for me and just a very fitting way to culminate the evening. So Alex, come take your microphone. Thank you so much, Seth. I, this has been such a Sports Illustrated gathering, and uh, the magazine, such as it is, such as it's left, has gone through some really, really rough times over the last few years. And boy, the, just the people involved with it gathered here today, and so many people have come up to me in the last 24 hours and talked about covers and people and moments. And um, some of the remarks we've heard already together from, from you, Walter, and, and Neil, and Seth, your kindness there. Um, and just thinking about Grant over these last few days um, on the way out here, so glad, Eric and Celine, that you can be here tonight um, as we honor him. You know, so much in life is about timing, and so much of Grant's sports writing life followed from where on the timeline his career fell. You know, his upbringing in Kansas was just old school enough that it skewed toward all things print. Yet his school teacher parents believed in spending the family's limited budget on magazine subscriptions instead of cable TV. For Christmas in 1982, they gave then 10-year-old Grant a subscription to Sports Illustrated. And each week, he turned every page. My way into this world, that's how Grant called it years later. I felt like I got to know the writers, guys like Frank DeFord, became these mythical heroes to me. In elementary school, Grant actually wrote the editors to put them on notice. Someday, I'll be writing for you. But get this. From Rockefeller Center, a reply actually came back, a rhetorical pat on the head. Thanks, Grant. That's nice. <laughs> Keep writing. But that letter meant so much to him and to his family. Remember, no cable TV because all those magazines were filling up the coffee table in the wall home. So Grant watched his first World Cup in 1990 on the over-the-air Spanish language station that the walls could somehow get with rabbit ears. In the late 20th century, if you wanted to be a quarterback, you went to Miami. If you wanted to be a magazine writer, you went to Princeton. And so Grant did, ascending inevitably to the sports editorship of the Student Daily winning a fellowship for a trip to Buenos Aires where he researched a thesis about soccer and Argentine society that won prizes in both politics and Latin American studies. 
and he came back from that trip wearing this Shirling aviator jacket that completely swept Celine off her feet. <laughs> taking courses with New York editor David Remnick and with a woman who had become his great mentor, the former New York Times Vietnam correspondent, Gloria Emerson. And for Remnick's course, he wrote a precocious profile of Emerson, highlighting her standards and her idealism. And then came 1996, that great inflection point on our timeline. Grant graduated just weeks before the Atlanta Olympics, the first to be driven by the web. And he was indeed hired by SI, joining a, pro a profession where the ground would soon shift beneath everyone's feet. For a dozen years or so, he primarily did what he had been trained to do, tell written stories in the classic SI fashion, always with his trademark empathy, fairness, and sense that sports, as a larger and larger part of the world, had the capacity to change the world. But in the same way Grant could see soccer's potential in the US, he could also see where journalism was headed, so he adapted. He used any platform to meet readers where they were migrating to, Twitter, Instagram, video, podcasting, mailbags. He truly became a master of modern sports writing. And eventually, as readers fled the weekly print magazine he had grown up on, Grant bet on himself. For his own Substack site, Football with Grant Wall, he went to Qatar twice, first to report on the regime's exploitation of migrant labor in preparations for the World Cup, and then to cover the cup itself. Before leaving for Qatar that last time, Grant performed what was partly an act of devotion and partly a renewal of vows. He took out his college profile of Gloria Emerson and reread it. We all know what happened in Qatar, but we couldn't have anticipated what was revealed after Grant's death, how thoroughly not just his storytelling, but also his kindness and humanity and sense of purpose had captivated people around the world. This recognition tonight is more evidence that Grant and his legacy continue to do so. So thank you, UT, for honoring that. And Eric, will you please come up and except on Grant's behalf, the Dan Jenkins Medal for Lifetime Achievement in Sports Writing. In uh, May of this year, uh, I had the privilege of narrating the audiobook of uh, Grant's best collected essays. And I was familiar in one way or another with, with all of the things that were in the book. Uh, and I had lobbied to make sure that uh, one of my favorite of his essays uh, from the Daily Princetonian uh, also featured there. And there's something about reading all of them out loud in a strange room um, with plates full of Granny Smith apples. If you know anything about narrating, um, it's a miracle for uh, reading audiobooks. I remember Grant working on some of the essays. I remember certain lines that I knew he was just excited to have written. Um, and he would call me sometimes to, to read some of these lines to me. Um, he could be impressed by a sentence. But more than that, he appreciated the people who helped bring him to where he thought he was at any given time. And reading all of his works, I think it's the first time that I was it's 
is going to sound horrible, but I'm the older brother. Really impressed with my brother <laughs> in a way that, I mean, Grant was always impressive, but comprehensively, the essays that, that were collected, to me, said more than Grant was a good writer who cared about the people involved in sports. The kind of person that Grant was is very evident in all of those essays. And in the past year and a half, which I know has been difficult for both of Selena and I, I've had more people come up to me with stories about Grant that are, that are similar. But the type of story that comes up the most often is when someone says, I was just starting out and I was in a press box and I realized that Grant Wall was right next to me. And it's funny when people are, are telling you almost hagiographic things about your little brother who you um, used to beat up on the couch. Um, and, at, and, at, and I was nervous and at the half, Grant asked me what I thought. And routinely, people who would tell me stories like this seem kind of like flummoxed that Grant would ask them for their opinion. But I think if you ever had the chance to meet Grant, um, you might understand that Grant really wanted to hear what people thought, especially if they were striking it out in a, in a difficult profession. And he took time to listen to people and I think so much of that goes back to getting a letter back from Sports Illustrated. I didn't have to send anything to him at all. Um, but I know how he felt when he got that letter. And I think for Grant, it was important to keep the ball rolling, so to speak. And there have been so many times in the past year and a half that something has happened in sports, sports doesn't stop. I've wondered like, oh, what would Grant have said about that? I've, I've had times where I wanted to pick up the phone and in that split second I remember, oh, I can't. Um, Grant had a knack for finding fascinating stories about fascinating people. And I think programs like the one here at, at UTA are important because Grant did leave kind of a hole. And the formats have changed, but there are a lot of stories to tell. And while I wish Grant were here to still tell them, my hope is that we're going to find more and different and better and broader. And maybe in some way, people can look at this book of collected works of his and gain some inspiration for some great new stories. Um, this means the world to our family. Thank you so much. Should mention, by the way, that Alex and another uh, former or just current editor at uh, Sports Illustrated, Mark Moravic, put together that collection of stories um, from Grant's career. You know, being a writer is about making choices, right? You get this sea of information. Talk about taking the river and putting it in a garden hose. A lot of choices get made when you're a writer. So uh, the best choice that Grant ever made in his life was his choice of who to spend his life with. Dr. Celine Grounder is an inter internationally known, revered expert uh, uh, in the field of uh, disease and medicine. And she is out there all the time talking and informing the public. Um, and she is outstanding at what she does. And as difficult as the last year and a half has been for her, she's done an amazing job telling Grant's story and keeping his flame alive because his story needs to be told over and over again. So Dr. Grounder, if you would come and say a few words, please.
Thank you, Seth and Alex and Eric. Um, there has not been a day since December 9th, 2022, that I have uh, not thought about Grant and his legacy and how to continue his legacy and um, all that he has left behind and how he inspires me and many others to be our best selves every day. And I was on my way to the airport this morning um, to fly here. And as is so often the case, I'm getting a message from one of his fans or mentees. And I just want to read this to you because I think this really captures so much of who Grant was. So here goes. Um, Good morning, doctor. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Michael Safoschnik. I just finished reading World Class, and I felt inclined to tell you my grant story. So for my real job, I am a NYPD detective in the Intelligence Intelligence Division in Brooklyn. I have been with the NYPD for 21 years. In my free time, I host a podcast, and I interview different athletes, authors, celebrities, and fascinating people. In April of 2018, I finished Grant's book. So this is uh, his anthology is actually his third book. And I said, I wish I could get him on. He's the reason I started watching soccer. Anyway, I set my alerts on my Twitter feed, and sure enough, he tweeted. And boom, I replied, hey, Grant, you're the reason I watch soccer. I just finished your book, and I'd love to have you on my podcast. The bar, Jack Dempsey's, gives me a private floor to do it. A minute later, he DM'd me, I'm in. I then explained that I don't want to waste his time and I only have like 2,000 listeners. He didn't care. Long story short, on April 30th, I podcasted, so April 30th, 2018, I podcasted with him and we had a blast. We drank beers and finished the show. A side note, my lieutenant and a couple other fans came to watch it. We did the show and he hung around for an hour or so afterwards. And he and I disagreed about everything from soccer to penalty kicks, politics, police stuff, and everything else. It was hilarious, but it was all done with laughs like old friends. My boss actually called out of work and his excuse was, I'm drinking beers with Grant Wall. I think he had to explain to his wife also when he came home a tad bit drunk. I walked him out and thanked him a million times over for coming on my show. Anyway, we took pics and said our goodbyes. A week later, I get a copy of his book in the mail, and he thanked me for having him on the show. Pure class. A side note, after the show, a few different soccer podcasts, way bigger than mine, reached out and said, how the hell did you get Grant live? I replied, I asked. Anyway, I just wanted to share this story of how a man so influential, so kind, so pure, took a night out from his life to drink beers and podcast with a small little show, and then humbly thanked me for having him on. Just an amazing man he has missed. Have a wonderful day, Michael. And I get notes like that every day. And he is missed. It's a fitting way to end the night because there's games and there's scores and there's stories. But I think what really we love about sports and what unites us about sports is the humanity. Uh, the reference to Willie Nelson tonight, I sort of feel like in today's somewhat divisive culture, music and sports are the, the sort of last bastions of Unity Island. So that said, let's all go to Willie's house. Let's smoke. <laughs> let's play the guitar. Let's enjoy life and let's celebrate the stories that were told tonight. Hopefully we'll see you next year.